Hello and welcome to the Whole Life Election Special. I'm Grace Fielding. And I'm Paul Woolley. And today we're talking about the SMP. Hello everyone and welcome back. Well, the election campaign is well underway and the political parties are currently slogging it out for your vote. There's certainly no shortage of media to consume at the moment. But here on the Whole Life podcast, we want to bring you something just a little bit different. We want to ask the question, how does the Christian story connect with the different traditions within our political parties? And how can this help shape the way that we vote? Yes, that's right. Now, in England, the main parties are, of course, Conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrat. But if you're living in Scotland or Wales, you have the option of the SNP, the Scottish National Party, or Plaid Cymru. And today we're focusing on the SNP. In the last general election, the SNP came third, winning 48 seats compared with just 11 for the Liberal Democrats. But who are the SNP and what is their link with the Christian story? It's been an eventful few months for the party. To what extent do the current vision and policies of the SNP align with the Christian faith? Well, we're delighted to be joined by John Mason, an SNP politician who served as a member of the Scottish Parliament for Glasgow Shettleston since 2011. Before that, he was a member of Parliament for Glasgow East and before that, a Glasgow City Councillor uh, for 10 years from 1998 to 2008. John is also a member of Easter House Baptist Church and is a well-known Christian in politics. And it's even got him into trouble on one or two occasions, which we might hear about later in the episode. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us on the Whole Life podcast today. It's really great to have you with us. Hey, very pleased to be taking part. Thank you. Um, so, John, we'll get into the politics of the SNP shortly, but I wondered and um, perhaps we could get to know you a little bit at the start um, and begin with a bit more of your personal story. Um, so how did you get into both politics um, and, I suppose, Christianity? Um, and I wonder uh, which came first? Is there any sense that kind of one led to the other? OK, well, that's a big question. So I could probably take up half the podcast uh, just talking about that. But I'll give you a brief synopsis and if you Brilliant. want to ask me more you can. Uh, so I was brought up in really quite a traditional Church of Scotland that is Presbyterian uh, in the near Glasgow and you know I think I always uh, personally I always believed that God existed but I didn't know anything about having a personal relationship with him and it was through a uh, scripture union at school that I came to a personal faith and that heard that you could actually know Jesus as a person and as a friend. So that was roughly when I was about 14 or so. And uh, then I went on, I trained as an accountant and um, not to go into too much detail, but really felt challenged uh, by God to go and work for a, some Christian organization rather than just your ordinary business. So I spent two years with Operation Mobilization um, in Bromley and Kent, uh, working with people like George Verwer and others at the um, doing, doing accountancy, obviously. And I get then through that, A, I got hugely challenged about prayer and also about missions and um, went out for three years uh, to Nepal, uh, again, to work as an accountant, uh, again, through this time through what was BMMF in currently InterServe and working in Nepal, where almost all the, 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 the Christian organizations work together, um, you know, like BMS, uh, American Lutherans, everything under the umbrella of United Mission to Nepal. And uh, so I was there for three years. That was back in the 1980s, which was a tremendous experience. And at, at that time, it was against the law for someone to change religion, become a Christian. So it was quite hard for the Nepali church, but it was uh, growing. And, and that led into my kind of political thinking, because I'd always been interested in politics. But um, when I saw Nepal, which is a tiny little country with very little in the way of resources, and they've got India to the south, they've got China to the north, and yet they were fiercely independent and still are, um, that made me think, well, if, if they can do that, Scotland can do that. And I met Canadians, and they did not want to be taken over by America, and I met New Zealanders, they did not want to be taken over by Australia. And so all the way around the world, small countries are often doing very well. And uh, so that kind of changed my thinking a bit. I came home much more committed to the idea of Scottish independence and joined the SNP and then gradually got involved, as you said, first as a councillor, uh, then an MP and now as an MSP. 
Brilliant. That was a very succinct answer. So I think it's enough to get us started. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. That's so interesting. And also particularly interesting that it sounds as if it was the SNP that led you to be more engaged in politics rather than a sense coming to politics generically and then discovering that your political home was the SNP. Is that right? Yes, I, th I think the SNP is perhaps a little bit different from other parties because some people would even call it a movement. Now, there is actually a wider independence movement, which includes more than just the SNP. There's also socialist parties, there's the Greens and others. Some people have no parties. But, I mean, the SNP has, most of my lifetime, has been the main focus and driver for independence. And as a result, it, it, we're quite a big tent as a party. We might come back to that later. And we have a, maybe a wider range of views within the party than, say, the Conservatives would have or Labour or the Lib Dems eh, or whatever, because we are united by this cause, this desire for Scotland to be free or to be independent. And eh, that does mean we're quite a mixture of people. And I think we've seen that in recent months. And, um, you know, we have people economically a bit to the right and a bit to the left. Uh, and when it comes to maybe social issues, we have people who are more liberal and people who are more conservative. So interesting. Now, I want to ask you a little bit about the history, the origins of the SNP in a minute. But where would you position the SNP in terms of the, the left and the right? Um, is it, I mean, I mean kind of... I suppose depending who you speak to within the SNP, you might you might get a different sense of that, which relates back to your comment about being a big tent. But where would you position the SNP politically on that spectrum? Well, I think we would generally say social democrat or left of centre or something uh, along these lines. And uh, certainly for, from an economic point of view, and, um, you know, I, I would like to go a bit further left, to be honest. But uh, others would want to be more in the centre or maybe slightly centre-right. So we have that whole spectrum. And it has varied, I would say, over time. Um, when Alex Salmond was the leader, it, you know, I think we had a bit more of the Big Ten idea and he was quite comfortable with the people going in slightly different directions. Uh, when Nicola Sturgeon took over, um, you know, it was definitely more of a commitment, uh, a bit to the, more to the left and on social issues, certainly more liberal. Uh, now, I, th I think that was maybe out of line with the SNP membership. I don't know, but um, it, it was interesting when we saw Kate Forbes involved in the, in the leadership contest um, that she got a lot of support from the membership, almost half, in fact, from the membership, but amongst the parliamentarians, the leadership, a lot less support. So, I get, again, I think that's just a picture of the party kind of moving and, and you know, covering quite a wide spectrum. Yeah, interesting. Um, let's talk then a little bit more about the origins of the SNP. Um, conservatism, socialism and liberalism are political traditions that date back to the 18th and 19th centuries. But the SNP was founded in 1934 and has had MPs in Westminster since I think it's 1967. Can you give us a short history of the SNP for those who are unfamiliar with it? And to what extent has it been shaped by the Christian tradition and the contribution of Christians? Well, I think, I mean, you've given about as much history as I know of it. I've not uh, really <laughs> studied the history in depth. Um, but yes, 1934 was the coming together of two, there had been two uh, separate independence parties and uh, they came together and formed uh, the SNP. So that's, what, 90 years ago, uh, just now. And actually the first MP we had was during the war. Um, but that, that that was slightly unusual because I think often at that time um, by-elections were not contested. And so we did actually have an MP for a short time in uh, 1945. But uh, you're right that 1967 was the big breakthrough. And I mean, when I was younger, I was, well, I'm now 66, but I was born 1957, so I would have been 10 at that time. And really up till then, the, the SNP was not taken seriously by the other parties, uh, not too seriously by the electorate. But 1967 was the big breakthrough when Ewing uh, stood in Hamilton and it made major repercussions, I think, both, well, certainly in Scotland, but I think in the UK as well. And people woke up to the idea that Scotland needed to have at least a bit more autonomy. Um, so again, it, it, it's all this that it, it was people drawn into the SNP for a variety of reasons, but the core one being independence. But another, a secondary one, has definitely been the likes of opposition to nuclear weapons. And uh, that's been 
very strong in the SNP. We only relatively recently decided that if we're independent, we would be part of NATO. And some members actually left at that point because they felt that NATO, it was so tied to nuclear weapons, even though not every member has nuclear weapons, that they could not um, uh, hold to that. And of course, that, that, that... there's Christian aspects to a lot of these things. I mean, there would be quite a strong Christian element of pacifism traditionally, or you know, at least opposition to nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. So, I, I don't think the origins of the SNP are particularly Christian uh, that I'm aware of. Other than that, Scotland obviously used to be known as quite a strongly committed Christian country, and you know, in comparison to Wales, I think I think probably Plaid Cymru is a bit more linked to the independent chapels in Wales. And Labour is a bit more linked to um, perhaps Methodism and, and is certainly in Scotland, Roman Catholicism and a, a lot of Christian input at the beginning of these parties, although I would suggest they've also perhaps drifted away from that a bit. Um, but that, that, that's kind of my understanding. So it's always been possible for committed Christians to be in the SNP, but loads of people would never have had any kind of faith position. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about nationalism. Um, I think sometimes people accidentally reference the SNP, the Scottish National Party, as the Scottish Nationalist Party. And uh, nationalism is something that I think Christians can have an uneasy relationship with or concerns about. Um, And I, I just want to sort of probe that a little bit with you about the extent to which the SNP is a nationalist party and to what extent nationalism in terms of uh, the vision of nationalism is compatible with Christianity. I mean, nationalism can often sound as if it it represents a kind of insularity, um, whereas some of what you would be talking about, John, would be basically around self-government. So do you want to just talk a little bit about that and, and how you see nationalism playing within the SNP? Um, yeah, well, again, there's quite a lot in this. And, and I mean, the words uh, are used in different ways. And I fully accept people, you know, especially uh, people from maybe Eastern Europe and things come to Scotland, they hear about the Scottish National Party and they think, oh, what is this? Does that mean it's right wing? Um, and we have sought, you know, very much to be social democrat, uh, very welcoming. Um, and the words, I mean, I would argue, pe- people say that, you know, patriotism is good, nationalism is bad. I would largely disagree with that. I think there's good and bad patriotism and I think there's good and bad nationalism. And the words tend to be um, used depending whether you're wanting to be positive about it or negative about it. I mean, on on, on the negative side, I would say, for example, the present uh, or the UK government that we've had in recent years uh, is more nationalist in the sense of trying to put up borders, stopping people crossing the channel, uh, cutting immigration, all that kind of thing, which you might think is traditionally nationalist. We are actually less nationalist from that point of view. We welcome people coming in. Scotland is short of people. We have an aging population. We need immigration very, very much. And uh, so, you know, I I would certainly read read, uh, scripture as welcoming the foreigner and and that kind of thing. So from that point of view, it's not being done for a Christian motive, but I think it's a good uh, attitude that that we have in that regard. So... um, Yes, I mean, I would say very much SNP, left of, left of centre, welcoming um, other people coming here. And we talk about with different concepts, new Scots, people who have come uh, to live here. Uh, we have uh, a number of people from an ethnic minority within uh, the party elected both in the Scottish Parliament uh, and at Westminster. Do you think the agenda of um, independence can at times bring out the worst of people. I, I'm conscious that as I observed the uh, campaign around uh, independence uh, a few years ago, um, one of the things that concerned me about that was seeing the the way that people were very tribal in the way that they engage with that campaign. Um, and I'm not suggesting actually that's wholly negative, but sometimes the way that it is presented can be negative. So people not feeling that they could perhaps put a poster in the window because they supported, for example, the union as opposed to independence um, and 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 seeing um, uh, some violence, but also just a lack of civility around that debate. I mean, how would you frame that and see that? Do you think, do you think my reading of that is unfair? 
I think a lot of the debate was quite civilised. And, and in fact, um, if I can just give a personal example, uh, some of the churches wanted specifically to have a civilised debate and they wanted uh, Christian politicians to speak on both sides. And one of the Conservative MSPs, Murdo Fraser, and I did a kind of tour of Scotland uh, speaking at church meetings and things. And I think we managed to do it on the whole in a fairly civilised way. So, I mean, yes, you get a... Uh, civilised uh, debates and you get less civilised debates. I, I think I would suggest that happens in every country. Um, I mean, we see some quite British nationalist, uh, you know, Farage and others um, who I would say engage in quite unpleasant uh, rhetoric and uh, debate. So I would say Scotland is no worse. I would probably feel Scotland is slightly better in the tone of the debate. Um, but I mean, yes, people. Some people always go over the score on both sides. There's there's the whole issue of the sectarianism in Scotland, especially the west of Scotland, Catholic and Protestant. Uh, the some of the some of the unionist side, not all of them, are very tied in with the Orange uh, marches and all of that. And um, you know that kind of fed into some of the independence debate because the the. The, the, the orange and similar side of things uh, took a very anti-independence uh, line. Although that in itself, I have to say, has changed over time. I mean, it used to be thought that, um, you know, it was more difficult for Catholics to vote for the SNP and, and the idea that what would an independent Scotland be like? Would it be like Northern Ireland? And then it's kind of swung over the years. Uh, and so we had a lot of support from the Catholic community for independence uh, and strong opposition from some of the kind of harder line Protestants. Mm. I'd love to talk a little bit about um, uh, the SNP's vision for society. And what I'm trying to get at is the extent to which independence is a means or an end. Um, in other words, if you were to describe the SNP's political vision, um, would you say that it's for an independent Scotland? Or would you say um, it, it's for something and an independent Scotland is part of the way in which we can bring that vision around. So how, how would you describe the political vision that the SNP has? Well, not to avoid your question, but I would say it's both. And okay. um, I, I have colleagues who, the minute we get independence, will retire from politics. And, and that's them. They've achieved what they wanted Scotland to be free. And they would just want Scotland to be independent, whether we're a bit to the left or a bit to the right, they're less relaxed, they're more relaxed about. Um, but it's certainly true that uh, other people have joined the SNP for, and it's perhaps especially in recent years, you know, for a package of um, measures and aims, and probably Nicola Sturgeon envisioned that more than anyone else, um, more of a kind of caring society, big emphasis on... Uh, equality for LGBT minority groups, uh, all of that kind of thing, but also for elderly people and also for babies and uh, lots of good things in there. And so some of them, during our kind of recent troubles, you know, some of them have maybe struggled a bit because they joined the SNP as they saw it, being this, you know, particular brand of um, kind of independence. Uh, and now, they have not perhaps realised the history of it all, which is much broader and much wider. And, you know, sometimes we might, as I said, we might be a bit left to centre, sometimes a bit more to the right. So that that continues to be a challenge for the party. And um, I, I'm personally very keen that we maintain, I, I don't want, you know, Christians to take over the party or left of centre people to take over the party or anything like that. I just want, I want the big tent to continue with as many people on board as possible. But obviously, especially when we're in government, we have to have policies. So we have to set the tax rate. We have to decide about giving a payment to poorer families. You know, all of these kind of things, what we're doing with the NHS. So um, we do have to have specific policies. Not all of them. I'm, ha I'm happy to confess I'm necessarily totally happy with, but probably nobody in the party is totally happy with the whole package. Um, but... Uh, I, I do believe it's still a party that a Christian can be comfortable in just as much as in uh, Labour or the Tories or the Lib Dems. 
Great. Well, we'll um, come on to policies um, in just a moment, John. But um, I wondered first, I alluded in my intro to um, the fact that you have at times received criticism for some of the contributions that you've made um, on sort of several particularly prickly contentious issues. So things like gender identity, abortion, um, family policy. So I wonder from sort of your perspective, what do you see as most challenging about being a Christian in politics? Well, I I think... We're in a society that has moved away from the idea of Christendom. I mean, I'm in a Baptist church. I do not believe that the church and the state should be close at all. And so I'm comfortable with the idea that now uh, the church and the state are um, kind of more distinct from each other. But along with that, I think, goes uh, more scepticism about religion generally and certainly Christian faith and certainly those of us that hold to what I would see as a biblical a view and taking the Bible fairly literally and some of its teaching uh, on marriage, sexual issues, uh, all of that kind of space. So I think, I mean, I was just recently read Tim Farden's book, um, was it Messy Politics or something like that, I think it was called. And, uh, you know, he lays out very well the some of the issues that we're facing. And he faced big challenges when he was the leader um, of the Liberal Democrats and I think for Christians, we can expect in society, and that's not just in politics, things that's in schools, in hospitals, in business, eh, we can expect increasing opposition. Eh, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I think the church does well when we look at in the book of Acts or we look in China, the church does well when it's under a certain amount of pressure. Mm-hmm. And the good thing is it is still possible for committed Christians to be in eh, all the main parties, whether it's possible or or very likely that a committed Christian can be a leader of the main parties is, I think, another question. Mm. Um, But, you know, on the whole, I mean, again, different leaders in the SNP, Alex Salmond, it was very keen to keep on board committed Christians. He was very supportive of me, uh, although not agreeing with me all the time. And um, people, you know, totally at the opposite end of the spectrum who just want rid of religion and uh, so on and so forth. So I, d- I don't think there's anything particularly strange about Scottish politics or um, uh, the SNP in that regard. Um, and I think we have to accept it. Now, one of my colleagues did switch party because she felt the SNP was not supportive enough for her Christian values and then things like abortion and so on. Yeah. But I think I think we're having to adapt. I mean, I'm now 66, going on 67, and, um, you know, things have changed a lot in my lifetime from where Christian values and such like were very much accepted. The church was very much at the center of society. That is clearly less so. And I think we have to adapt to that. And, and just to finish, I mean, my models then, the people I look to aren't Moses and David who led God's people. They are Daniel who was in Babylon. They are Esther who was in Susa mm-hmm. and um, Joseph in Egypt. And so they were people who were God's people in a hostile environment. And I think that's quite frankly where we are nowadays in Britain, politics, education, health, all of these areas, that's where we are. Yeah, what brilliant examples to um, to look to from the Bible. Um, so we've mentioned a little bit, a bit about policies um, and I know that you mentioned um, in an answer just a little while back about sort of things like, you know, the sense of wanting to welcome people into Scotland. And obviously that's very aligned with um, Jesus's teaching on scripture about, you know, welcoming um, the foreigner and the stranger. Um, but I suppose, are there other examples that you could give us of how you see the Christian story um, specifically connecting with SMP policy? Um, and yeah, are there, are there sort of policies at the moment that you feel like are, are resonant with the Christian story in that way? Well, I mean, I, mean, I... I think we have to start with saying that there's no party has a monopoly on Christian values and um, Christians are very varied and look at things very differently from place to place. And, you know, the big divide, I suppose, is between America and Europe, that on the whole, a lot of Christians in Europe would be evangelical Christians would be left of centre and a lot in America would be right of centre. So there is all of that. So I'm certainly not going to argue that uh, the SNP has more Christian values than other parties, but um, I personally believe strongly in raising taxes and having better public services, and that tends to benefit the poorer and more disadvantaged in our society. And I represent quite a mixed constituency, but many people would see it as one of the poorer constituencies in Scotland. And uh, there is a lot of need. It's not, it's not just material need. There's uh, People are isolated 
uh, people are spiritually lonely and uh, all sorts of things. But we basically do need more money. We have an aging population. People are living longer. That's great. The NHS keeps coming up with new uh, drugs and techniques that are helping people live better lives. But these all cost money. And I feel strongly that the UK as a whole is a low tax country. And uh, if we're genuine about caring for people, we need to share out the income and the wealth more evenly. Um, so that is broadly where the SNP is left of centre. And, and you can argue it's not that far away from traditional labour. Labour obviously moves around a bit uh, as well. But I'm very comfortable in that space. And I would tend to argue personally for higher taxes and better public services. Um, but, you know, I've got colleagues in the SNP who feel, well, we can't we can't raise the tax too much above England or that will have a negative effect. So there's a lot of issues we're playing with uh, around that. But, you know, I, I look to Denmark, uh, considerably higher taxes, considerably better public services, and I'm very comfortable with that model. Yeah. Are there any other policies that um, come to mind that sort of you can see this link between, um, you know, the sort of Christian story or Christian faith and, um, and, and yeah, the SNP policy? Yeah. <sighs> I mean, I mean, I don't know. We could go through every kind of policy that there is and uh, kind of look at it. I mean, I think caring for the environment. Um, now, uh, we had been in an agreement with the Greens, and obviously that's even strengthened that. But I think within the SNP, there is a strong commitment uh, to the environment, climate change, uh, all of that. And of, I mean, a lot of these things are, I confess, for selfish reasons. I mean, Tourism is hugely important for Scotland, more so, I think, than than for England. And uh, so we want a clean uh, country that is attractive and uh, all the rest of it. So, um, you know, we need to uh, reforest a lot of, our, of, of Scotland compared to other European countries. We're very deforested. Um, and uh, although we're planting more trees than the rest of the UK, I think, um, We've got so much land that's empty and that used to have trees on it. So we need to go further on that. So so things like that, um, yeah, that would certainly currently, I mean, for a lot of people, the environment is you know a real key issue when it comes to um, voting and policies and so on. And, mm-hmm. you know, not to be too party political, but we've tended to find people, the other parties will sign up for um, a general... Uh, you know, to improve the environment, to improve air quality, all of these things. But when it comes to a specific um, uh, policy like a low emission zone or a, a workplace parking charge or some of these kind of things, uh, sometimes people are less keen to go through with it. Yeah. So if they're the sort of um, sort of more positive policies um, that you sort of can as a Christian, reconcile your faith and a policy. Um, I suppose on the flip side of the coin, um, you know, it's sort of fair to say the SNP has definitely received criticism, um, even within its own ranks for its position on a number of issues, some of which we've already mentioned, I mean, gender identity, freedom of speech. Um, how, how, as a Christian, do you sort of reconcile? I know you said earlier that there are some, obviously there are always going to be some policies that you don't necessarily agree with. Um, how do you how do you reconcile? How, how do those moments play out where um, you see policies sort of coming to fruition that actually you take a very different stance on? Um, maybe you could speak to a number of those sort of specifically. Well, we'll, t- we'll take the two you mentioned to start with. You can bring in more if you like. But gender, um, yes, I mean, Linked in uh, with the Greens, there was this strong push for uh, gender recognition reform uh, in Scotland, and I did oppose that. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, someone whose biological sex is male at birth, uh, that cannot be changed. So that was quite interesting because that was the first time in the SNP that we'd had a sizable number. There ended up nine of us out of uh, 64 um, who voted against the government. And that hadn't happened before since the SNP was in power at uh, Holyrood. So um, to some extent, we were allowed to do that and we weren't, none of us were disciplined after that. And I was the only one in that group that was coming at it from a faith position. Uh, most of the others would be from a feminist position uh, or uh, some just because of personal experiences or whatever um, were opposed to that. So... I mean, I actually thought that was quite good in the end because basically it did again show that the SNP was this big tent and we have a variety of views. 
uh, and that could be tolerated. Freedom of speech, I, I've not really had a problem uh, within the party. Um, there's been accusations. And I mean, this is where in the Christian realm amongst the churches, different groups take different views, I have to yeah. say. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I do work closely with the Christian Institute, with CARE and with the Evangelical Alliance. And they, they all take slightly different views on things and sometimes quite different views on things. So uh, we had hate speech legislation, which, in my opinion, was good, um, was it really only extending existing law and bringing us more into line with, with the law in England. And in fact, I think had the, has the possibility of protecting religious people, uh, including myself, from hatred being stirred up against us, because some of the secular and humanist a folk of whom some are in Parliament um, can be incredibly aggressive towards religious people generally, not just Christians, Muslims, or whatever. And, and I mean, one other MSP said to me one time in, in a debate, a, people like John Mason should not be allowed in Parliament. Now, uh-huh. now that's quite a hard line. That's quite extreme. So, I mean, freedom of speech, yes, but there has to be a line drawn. Um, as to to how far we go, and I certainly will see how it plays out. But I was comfortable with the Hate Crime Act, even though um, a number of Christian organisations were opposed to it. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you for being so honest. Um, the other issue that I know we've made reference to, but be interesting to ha- yeah, sort of have your take on it briefly, um, is obviously the issue of abortion. Um, what yeah, what, how would you kind of speak to that? Yes, well, I it, it's I'm in a smaller minority. I have to say, when it comes to yeah. abortion, uh, I'm strongly pro life. I've always tried to be open about that. Um, I've been elected eight times, which is more than any other SNP person in Glasgow uh, at different levels. And I've always people have asked me in every election. Some people will ask, um, you know, what's your position on abortion? And some people hate the SNP, but will vote for me because I'm pro life. Other people like the SNP but hate me because I'm pro life. So uh, I think I've been quite consistent in that. And, um, you know, and it's such an emotive issue, abortion, over, say, something like assisted dying, where, you know, there's a lot more kind of thought and people are more open to to new ideas and thinking about it. Uh, Whereas with abortion, most people are pretty dug in. Um, So, but I've, as I say, I've tried to be consistent. I've been elected a number of times. And, you know, the East End of Glasgow, it's quite traditional in, in some ways. I mean, bad traditions as well as good traditions. Um, Catholic Church would be quite strong compared to other areas, perhaps. So specifically in 2008, when I was elected, so that was a by-election to Westminster, and it was a strong Labour seat, and we won it in, in 2008. And one of the issues at that time was the embryology bill, and um, abortion was kind of tied in with that and I made my position very clear all the other candidates were pro-choice and um, I won the by-election so it certainly didn't do me any harm and some people actually felt it was a key point in deciding that particular election I mean that was 16 years ago so uh, obviously things have changed and when I was at Westminster I then got involved Uh, there was a pro-life group and the embryology bill I was quite involved with and also the Equality Act when it went through uh, 2009 and 10. Oh, thank you. John, let's just very briefly talk about tax, um, only because you referenced it. And um, of course, Scotland does have a higher tax rate than England. Um, but the outcomes in terms of education and health are are, are challenging. I was going to say not good, but I, I, I guess it depends <laughs> what we're comparing with. But certainly historically, for example, Scotland education system would have been the kind of the envy of certainly the rest of the UK, if not the world. Um, how how do you think about those things? Because of course, you know, on on the one hand, people would be maybe up for saying, "Look, I'll see a bit of my tax go up if I can see the outcomes improve." Um, it may be just now that people are, are struggling to see the improvement in outcome. How how would you narrate that? How would you respond to that? Yes, well, I think, I think firstly, some of these problems are very long standing, and uh, we've had health challenges and inequalities um, for a very long time. So we are trying to address these. and um, But some of it will take a long time. I mean, if you take drugs as an example, 
the um, you know if, if people are taking drugs in their in their teens and twenties, that does affect the, assuming they they stay alive. Uh, that does affect them for the rest of their life, and, and we're seeing deaths now uh, for people who you know were taking drugs or starting to take drugs quite a long time ago. So that's it's a ship that takes quite a while to turn round. And we are trying different things. And it's not just tax. I mean, a drug consumption rooms a, is being promoted. I was not entirely comfortable with them because it does mean people buying drugs illegally and taking them, but it does seem to have saved lives in other countries. So I think it is something worth looking at and it's going to be in my constituency and um, I am broadly a supportive of that. Um, I mean, we have some positives. Our, our waiting times are lower in the NHS uh, than they are in, I think, England or Wales. And um, so there is an argument to say that uh, some of our finances um, are in better shape. Uh, I still think our taxes are too low, but we're kind of restricted what, how much we can raise them. But I mean, if you take the UK, we pay about 38% of GDP in tax. France pays 50%. So I think there's a problem for the, a challenge for the whole UK that if we want um, better public services, we really are going to have to pay for them. Education, I think it's quite hard to measure education between countries. I mean, some people would look at what we used to have, which was a very rigid system. Uh, and, you know, I think some of the countries of East Asia perhaps have more of that kind of system that now where you sit the kids down in rows and they learn things by rote. And I didn't particularly enjoy my time at school um, I suppose I got good qualifications. I've had a good career, but um, you know when I go into schools now, on the whole, I, I see a much more rounded individuals coming out of the school. Yes, their grammar's poorer than it used to be, um, but they are more confident. They have a better relationship with their teachers th than we did when I was there. Um, but I mean, there's challenges as well. I mean, I, I know down south too. Um, T teachers being physically attacked in in schools that happens in Scotland as well. I'm afraid. Um, so we do have challenges. Some things are very good. Our universities are you know at the top, um, but uh, no, I, I fully accept those challenges. And some of them are the same as other Western countries. Some of them are unique to Scotland. But I mean, alcohol and drugs. I fully accept. We've tried with alcohol. It's not just been tax. It's been minimum unit pricing, uh, which I, I'm very supportive of uh, so i think we need to tackle these things but there's often not one one answer to the whole problem mm. um when it comes to the general election not long away now um the smp obviously can't win the uk election but it could exert its influence um indeed you know arguably it, it has done with the number of mps that it has had um over the last um a few years um would the smp be willing to enter coalition with another party at Westminster and if so what what's the price what's the SNP price for a coalition yes I, I think probably people are not talking so much about a coalition at the moment but uh, that that can clearly change uh, when we had small majorities for a uh, one party or another that certainly made a difference in the past um as I'm we're speaking as we're recording this you know it does look like labor uh, would possibly get an overall majority in which case we would work with that. And I think we would hope to have a better relationship with a UK Labour government than a UK Conservative government. Although I have to say that's changed a lot over time because, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago, Conservative government, and we got on reasonably well. Uh, more recently, it's become uh, really quite uh, antagonistic, I'm afraid. So, but the, but the SNP would be continuing to push for progressive um policies i mean we, and if, if we had any influence depending we would be pushing at a uk level uh, obviously for things like the two child uh, limit uh, we think is is a major mistake and some of the other restrictions on benefits uh, we see at westminster we're taking over more benefits ourselves and trying to make them a bit more people friendly um so that's just an example of where we'd want to go obviously in the independence thing we'd like to be able to have a referendum and decide when to do that ourselves I personally think there's no particular rush for that because I think the Scottish public are still a bit undecided. Mm. Um, so, John, here's your opportunity. Um, we're approaching polling day. If I'm in Scotland, if I'm registered to vote, give me your pitch. Why should I use my vote for the SNP? What would you say? Well, I would say, first of all, uh, for independence, um, 
when I was 21 or so, I left home and set up home on my own. And yes, it cost a bit to start with, but I have no regrets about that. And my life has been better because I've had my own place and I run my life and I decide when I'm wanting to eat and when I'm wanting to sleep and all of these things. So uh, leaving aside the economics and everything else, I think it would definitely be better for the people of Scotland to um, stand on their own two feet, to have the freedom uh, that we used to have uh, many years ago. Uh, on a more perhaps practical and immediate uh, line, then uh, the SNP is a party that uh, believes in community, believes in society. We want to help those who are struggling the most, be that asylum seekers, uh, families with children in, in poverty, uh, pensioners who are struggling as well with isolation and loneliness. So partly some of that will be through uh, taxation. We'd like to uh, push the taxes uh, up a little bit. But um, other issues, uh, it, it's, it's other policies. And I've mentioned things like minimum unit pricing. And we certainly believe in government intervening, not taking over, not running the whole show, but uh, getting involved and not just standing back and letting things happen, as we do feel that some of the UK parties tend to do. Brilliant. Well, John, um, we really appreciate you putting time aside today to talk to us. Um, It's been so interesting. Thank you so much. Um, And we hope that in all the storm of an election campaign that you are um, able to take uh, moments to pause and remember, um, yeah, your foundational faith and trust in God, which you so kindly shared with us um, today. Um, So thank you so much. Um, It's been a pleasure. Well, Paul, how, uh, how did you find our conversation with John today? Well, I've got a little secret for you, Grace. You probably know this already, oh. but I am in fact Scottish. Did you know that? And I didn't. Um, I wow. know. Well, it's okay. probably my very strong Scottish accent that gave it away for you. But um, <laughs> I and therefore I I feel though I live in England that I've got some skin in the game in this, mm. and always feel um, particularly when it came to the independence referendum, a little bit kind of cross that I didn't get a vote in that. Not living in Scotland, obviously. Um, I haven't for ages, by the way. Um, but I thought it was really interesting. And um, I thought um, there were several things. I mean, firstly, John is quite an unusual politician, I would say, in terms of the way he came across. I mean, very sort of, very relaxed, very non-defensive, um, very yeah. open. And um, I really appreciated that. Um, secondly, I thought his own personal story that he described was just mm. fascinating um, in terms of the way he got into the SNP and then more generally politics um, and his background is just is, is really interesting, isn't it? All those different experiences that he had and, and the way that that formed his thinking and, and framed um, his approach. Um, and then I thought, um, particularly, obviously, on the subject of Scottish independence, um, but then in terms of other policy areas, um, the way he is clearly attempting to, to to bring a Christian mind to those things is so interesting. And obviously, he's also willing to do that in ways that mean that at times he's no doubt um, not very popular, um, not least within his own party. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, and I thought, you know, it's quite interesting, isn't it, to hear uh, a politician talk very openly about thinking that, you know, tax should be higher. Um, that Absolutely. is that he is quite unusual, isn't very it? Very non-apologetic about that, was he, wasn't he? Indeed. No, what did you think? Um, I've just been listening very hard, Paul, to hear if I can I can sense a little Scottish yeah. twang in anything you've been saying. But, Do you think um, John might have just brought to... that out a little bit, you know? Perhaps, then... perhaps. There's nothing like a, fe- a fellow Scotsman to do that for you. Exactly um, right. No, I would agree with everything. I think he, um, if I'm honest, I probably differently to you don't know a huge amount about the SNP other than obviously, um, you know, the fact that, you know, Scottish independence is clearly a very, well, the sort of driving force behind um, the party. So I found it really interesting kind of hearing, um, I think, yes, John was um, quite open about, as you say, sort of specific policies, which if I'm honest, I didn't necessarily know um, were linked to the party before. Um, and I I really liked the moment where he spoke about how his his kind of model or the, the, the characters in scripture that he um, sort of relates to now um, being, I think I've got this correct, being, you know, people more like sort of Daniel and Esther. Is that is that right? Yeah, I got that's that? right. Well, that's what I heard. <laughs> As opposed to David, um, you know, people living in, in hostile environments, but actually seeking to to live in a way that is is honoring to God in light of their faith and I I just I think that 
it, yeah, it was just interesting that, you know, they, they were names and clearly people that he's, he studied and has, um, I suppose, s- sort of sought to learn from in the way that he conducts himself within, as you say, what must be, because I mean, I, yeah, I, I agree. I was thinking, you know, when, especially around some of the votes that he was talking about on the sort of the, the tough issues. Um, and I think, you know, when he was saying that, you know, he was he was so much in the minority and I think potentially on one occasion, even the, one of the only people who voted a certain way. And I was thinking, gosh, actually, you know, relationally within, as you say, you know, with fellow politicians within your own party, um, let alone then that being brought into the public eye um, is is quite remarkable. But I but I agree his temperament was not. Well, I, I just thought he was very gentle, actually, um, and and I think I noticed as well there was a there was a consistency with that what he spoke with wasn't there in the sense of um, he wasn't apologetic about what he believed in, whether that be policy or his faith, um, but he also, you know, he had an open mindedness whilst wanting to clearly stay true to what he believed in. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting um, and. Yeah, I think, as I say, having having not had a huge amount of prior knowledge, I feel like I now have a much greater understanding of of what the SNP stands for and some of the kind of intricacies within that. Um, so, yeah, just really great to hear from another Christian. I mean, I think it's so interesting, isn't it, how we're interviewing Christians in actually very, very different political parties, but actually that that, that obviously that that fact that we all know that they all they all believe wholeheartedly in the same God, but that can look so different in terms of how their political persuasions, um, you know, play out. So um, looking forward to the next one. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? The joining of the dots um, between the Christian story and then what that looks like in terms of engagement within society generally and politics particularly, and then an SMP, uh, a party specifically. Um, and I, I suppose what you know I'm appreciating is seeing the, the sort of the integrity of people seeking to do that seriously, mm. but also recognizing that they often end up in very different places. Um, so where John ends up when it comes to tax policy, or when it uh, where he ends up, even in terms of even on some of the the sort of more contentious stuff like some of the free speech stuff, um, you know, in a different place from from others that we're speaking to. Um, but nonetheless, you couldn't really question the um, the uh, uh, kind of authenticity of, yeah. of of who he is and, and what he's trying to do, which is um, yeah. which is really encouraging. Absolutely. Um, well, if you've enjoyed this um, election special episode of The Whole Life, we'd love you to um, let us know your thoughts in the comments and to tell your friends about it. But until next time, um, from Paul and me, that was The Whole Life. Uh, goodbye, everyone. And we hope you'll join us again soon. Goodbye.